Hey readers, welcome back to Reads with Room B with me, Room B. Uh, today we are going to continue our read, Peter Pan. We are on chapter five. But before we start, I would like you to make I would like to make you, our viewers, aware as always that any and all proceeds, if there are any, will go directly to Greater Ormond Street. And that if you, dear reader, would like to donate directly, the link to their donation page will be posted in the comments section of this video. Also, J.M. Berry uses the word redskins, which we now know is quite offensive to the native American populace and peoples. We apologize for the use of this language and we realize that it is not acceptable for today in, today, in, well, in today's society. Uh, unfortunately, it is the author's word choice, so please forgive us and we still hope that you will enjoy the story. Right, let's move forward. Chapter five, The Island Come True. Bailey Peter was on his way back. The Neverland had woken into life. We ought to use the, plur the pearl fist and say awakened. But woke is better and is always used by Peter. In his absence, things are usually quiet on, on the island. The fairies take an hour longer in the morning and the bees tend to their young. The redskins feed heavily for six days and nights. And when pirates and the lost boys meet, they merely bite their thumbs at each other. With the coming of Peter, who hates lethargy, they are un underway again. If you put your ear to the ground now, you would hear the whole island seething with life. On this e evening, one of the chief the chief forces of the islands were disposed as follows. The lost boys were out looking for Peter. The pirates were out looking for the lost boys. And the redskins were out looking for the pirates. And the beasts were out looking for the redskins. They were going round and round the island, but because they did not meet, they were going round and round the island, but they did not meet because all were going at the same rate. All wanted blood except the boys, who liked it as a rule. But tonight were out to greet their captain. The boys of uh, the boys on the island vary, of course, in numbers. According to, according as when they get killed and so on, and when they and when they seems to be growing up, which is against the rules, Peter thins them out. But this, but at this time there were six of them, counting the twins as two. Let us pretend to lie here among the sugar cane and watch them as they steal by in single file, with each a hand on his dagger. They are forbidden by Peter to look the least like him, and they wear skins of bears they slain by themselves, in which they, they are so round and furry that when they fall, they roll. They have therefore become very sure-footed. The first to pass is Tootles, he, not in the least brave, but most unfortunate of that gallant band. He has been in the, fewer, the fewest adventures of any of them, because big things constantly happen when he had just stepped around the corner, all would be quiet, and he would take the chance of going off after uh, going off to gather a few sticks of firewood, and then when he returned, the others would be sweeping up the blood. This ill luck had given a gentle melancholy to his countenance, but instead of souring his nature, had sweetened it, so that he was quite the humblest of boys. Poor kind Tootles. There is a danger in the air for you tonight. Take care lest adventure is now offered you, which, if accepted, will punch you will plunge you into deepest woe. Toodles, the fairy Tink, who is bent on mischief this night, is looking for a tool, and she thinks you are the most easily tricked of all the boys. Wear the Tinker Bell. Would that he could hear us, but we are really not on the island. He, and as he passes by, he is biting his knuckles. Next comes Nibs, the gay and debonair. 
followed by Slightly, who cuts whistles out of trees and dances ecstatically to his own tunes. Slightly is most conceited of the boys. He thinks he remembers the day before he was lost, with their manners and customs, and this has given his nose an offensive tilt. Carly is fourth. He is a pickle, and so often he has delivered up his person when Peter has said sternly, Stand forth, the one who did this thing, that now, at the command, he stands forth automatically, whether he has done it or not. And the last come the twins, who, ca who cannot be described, because we would be sure to be describing the wrong one. Peter never quite knew what twins were. His band were not allowed to know things he did not know, so these two were always vague about themselves and did their best to give satisfaction by keeping close together in an apologetic sort of way. The boys vanish in the gloom, and after a pause, but not a long pause, for things go briskly on the island, come to the, pi the pirates on their track. We hear them before they are seen, and it is always the same dreadful song. A vast belay, yo ho, to he heave to, a pirating we go, and if we are parted by a shot, we're sure to meet below. A villainous, a more villainous looking lot never hung in a row on the execution dock. Here, in a, li a little in advance, ever and again, with his head to the ground, listening, and his great arms bare, pieces of eight in his ears as ornaments, is the handsome Italian Ciso, who cut his name in the letters of blood on the backs of the governor of the prison, of, of prison at Gao. The gigantic black behind him has many names. He has since dropped the one with which the dusky mothers still terrify their children on the banks of Gonjonjombo. And here is Bill Jukes, every inch of him tattooed, the same Bill Jukes who got six dozen on the walrus from the flint before he would drop the bag of moldy airs. And Cookson, said to be Black Murphy's brother, but this was never proved. And Gentleman Starkey, once an usher at a public school and, uh, and still dainty in his ways of killing. And Skylights, Morgan Skylights. And the Irish... Bosun, Smee, an oddly genial man who stabbed, so to speak, without offence, and was only nonconformist in Hook's crew, and the Noddler, whose hands were fixed on backwards, and robbed Mullins, and Elf, and Alf Mason, and many other ruffians long known and feared among the Spanish main. In the midst of them, the blackest and largest in the dark in that dark setting, reclined James Hook, or as he wrote himself, Jazz Hook, of whom it was said he was the only man the sea cook feared. He lay at his ease in a rough chariot drawn and propelled by his men, and instead of a right hand, he had an iron hook, which Ever and anon, he encouraged them to increase their pace. As dogs, this terrible man treated, treated them and addressed them, and as dogs, they obeyed him. In person, he was cadaverous and black advised, and his hair was dressed with long curls, which at a distance looked like black candles, and gave a singularly threatening expression to his handsome countenance. His eyes were blue, of forget me his eyes were the blue of the forget me not and a profound and of a profound melancholy save when he was plunging his hook into you at which time two red spots appeared in them and lit them ho up horribly in a manner something in manner of something of grand seer still clung to him so that even if he ripped you up with air with an air and I have been told that he was still recoup of, of certain repute, that he was never more sinister when he was polite. 
which was probably the true test of breeding. The elegance of his diction, and even when he was sorry, he was no less no less was the distinction of his demeanour. Show him <coughs> showed him one of a different caste from his crew, a man of indomitable courage, and it was said that he only shied at the sight of his, at one, he only shied at one thing, the sight of his own blood, which was thick and of an unusual colour. In dress, he somewhat aped the attire associated with the name Charles the Second, having heard it said in some earlier period of his career that he bore same strange resemblance, resemblance to the ill-fitted Stuarts. And in his mouth he had a holder of his own contrivance, which enabled him to smoke two cigars at once. But undoubtedly, undoubtedly the grimiest part of him of, of all was his iron claw. <clears throat> Let us now kill a pirate to show Hook's method. Skylights will do. As they pass, Skylight slurches clumsily against him, ruffling his lace collar. The hook shoots forth. There is a tearing sound, a screech, and the body is kicked aside. The pirates pass on. He has not even taken the cigars from his mouth. Th such is a terrible man whom is pitted against Peter Pan. Which will win? On the trail of the pirates, stealing noiselessly down the warpath, which is not visible to inexperienced eyes, will come the redskins. Every one of them, with his eyes peeled, they carry tomahawks and knives, and their naked bodies gleam with paint and oil. Strung around them are the scalps of boys as well as pirates, for these are the Piccaninny tribe, and they are not to be confused with the soft-hearted Delawares or Hurons. In the van, and on all fours, is a great big little panther, a brave of so many scalps that in his present position they somewhat impede his progress, bringing up the rear in place of the, in place of the greatest danger comes Tiger Lily, proudly erect, a princess in her own right. She is almost beautiful as dusky Dinas, the belle of the Piccaninnies, coquettish, cold, and amorous by turns. There is not a brave who would have who would not have the wayward thing to wife, but she staves off the altar with a hatchet. <sighs> Observe how they pass over falling twigs without making the slightest noise. The only sound to be heard is their somewhat heavy breathing. The fact that they are all just a little fat, they are all a little fat just now after heavy gorging, but in some time they will work this off. For the moment, however, it constitutes their chief danger. The redskins disappear as they have become like the shadows, and soon the beasts, and soon their place is taken by the beasts, a great and motley procession. Lions, tigers, bears, innumerable smaller and savage things flee from them, flee from them, for every kind of beast, and more particularly all the man eaters, leave cheek by jowl on the favored isle, their tongues hanging out, they are hungry tonight, and when they have passed, they come at last, they co comes the last figure of all, a gigantic crocodile. <laughs> We shall see wh whom she is looking for presently. The crocodile passes, but soon the beers, the boys appear. The crocodile passes, but soon the boys appear again, for the procession must continue indefinitely until one of the parties stops or changes its pace, and then quickly they will all be on top of each other. All are keeping a sharp lookout in the front but none suspects the danger that may be creeping up from behind. This shows how real the island was. <laughs> the first to fall out of the moving circle was the boys. 
They flung themselves down on the sward and close to their underground home. I do wish Peter would ho would come back, every one of them said nervously, though in height and still more, more in breadth, they were all larger than their captain. I am the only one who is not afraid of who is not afraid of pirates, said Slightly, in a tone that prevented his his being a general favourite. But perhaps some some distant sound disturbed him, for he added hastily, but I wish he would come back and tell us whether he has heard anything more about Cinderella. They talked of Cinderella, and Toodles was confident that his mother must have been very much like her. It was pe only in Peter's absence that they could talk of mothers. Mothers, the subject was forbidden by him as being silly. All I remember about my mother, Nibs told them, is she often said to my father, Oh, how I wish I had a checkbook of my own. I don't know what a checkbook is, but I should just love to give one to my mother. And while they talked, they heard distant sounds. You or I, not being in the wild, wild things of the woods, would have heard nothing, but they heard it, and it was a grim song. Yo-ho, yo-ho, the pirate life. The flag of skull and bones, and merry hour, hemp and rope, and hey, Davy Jones for life. At once, lost boys, but where were, but where were they? They were no longer there. Rabbits could not have disappeared more quickly. I will tell you where they are, with the exception of Nibs, who has darted away to Reconorda. They are already in their underground home, a very delightful residence, which we shall see a good deal of presently. But how have they reached it, for there is no entrance to be seen, not so much as a large stone, which, if rolled away, would disclose the mouth of a cave. Look closely, however, and you may note that there are seven large trees, each with a hole in its hollow trunk, as large as a boy. These are the seven entrances to the underground home, for which Hook has been searching in vain for many moons. Will he find it tonight? <laughs> as the pirates advance, the quick eye of Starkey is sighted. Nibs disappears through the wood, and at once his pistol flashes out. But an iron claw grips his shoulder. Captain, let go, he cried, writhing. Now, for the first time, we hear the voice of Hook. It was a black voice. Put back that pistol first, it said threateningly. It was one of those boys you hate. I could have shot him dead. Aye, and the sound would have brought Tiger Lily's redskins upon us. Do you want to lose your scalp? I shall after him, Captain. Shall I after him, Captain, as pathetic Smee, and tickle him, uh, and tickle him with Johnny Corkscrew? Smee had, some, had pleasant names for everything, and his cutlass with Johnny Corkscrew, because he wiggled it, he wiggled it in the wound. One could mention many lovable traits of Smee. For instance, after killing, it was his spectacles he wiped instead of his weapon. Johnny's a silent fellow, he reminded Hook. Not now, Smee, Hook said darkly. He's only one, and I want mischief of all seven. Scatter and look for them. The pirates disappeared among the trees, and in a moment their captain and Smee were alone. Hook heaved a heavy sigh. I know not why it was, perhaps because of the soft beauty of the evening. But there came over him a desire to confide in his faithful bosom the story of his life, and he spoke long and earnestly, but what it was all about Smee, who was rather stupid, did not know in the least. Anon he caught the word Peter. Most of all, Hook was saying passionately, I want their captain, Peter Pan. Twas he who cut off my arm. He brandished the hook threateningly. I waited a long time to shake his hand with this. Oh, I'll tear him. And yet, said Smee, I have often heard you say that Hook was worth a score of was worth a score of hands for combing the hair and other homely uses. 
I, the captain answered, if I was a mother, I would pray to have children born with this instead of that. And he cast a look of pride upon his iron hand and one of scorn upon the other. And then again he frowned. Peter flung my arm to a crocodile that happened to be passing. I have often, said me, noticed your strange dread of crocodiles. Not of crocodiles, but of the crocodile. The one crocodile. It liked my arm so much to me that it has followed me ever since, from sea to sea to land to land, licking its lips in, in search of the rest of me. In a way, said me, it's a compliment. I want no such compliments. Hook bark, barked petulantly. I want Peter Pan, who first gave the brute its taste for me. He sat down on a large mushroom, and there was a quiver to his voice. Smee, he said huskily, that crocodile would have had me before this, but by luck and chance it swallowed a clock, and which goes tick, tick inside, and so before it can reach me, I hear the tick, tick, and bolt. He laughed, but in a hollow way. Some day, said Smee, the clock will run down, and then he'll get you. Hook wetted his dry lips. I, that's the fear that haunts me. Since sitting down, he had felt curiously warm. Smee, the seat is hot. He jumped. Odd, odd bulbs, hammer and tongs, I'm burning, they exclaimed. The mushroom was the size and solidity known to the mainland. They tried to pull it up, and it came away at once in his hand, for it had no root. And stranger still, so it began to ascend. The pirates looking at each other. A chimney, they both exclaimed. Indeed, they had discovered the chimney of the underground home, and it was custom of the boys to stop it with mushrooms when the enemies were in the neighborhood. Not only smoke came out of it, there also came children's voices. <clears throat> For so safe did the boys feel in their hiding place that they were chattering gaily. The pirates listened grimly, then replaced the mushroom. They looked around them and noted the holes in the, tree in the seven trees. Did you hear them say Peter Pan's home? Smee whispered, fidgeting with Johnny Corkscrew. Hook nodded. He stood for a long time, lost in thought, and at least a curdling smile lit his swarthy face. Unrip your plan, Captain. He cried. Uh, Smee had been waiting for it. Unrip your plan, Captain, he cried eagerly. To return to the ship, replied. Hook replied slowly through his teeth, and cook a large, rich cake of jolly thickness with green sugar on it. There can be no, there can be but one room below, for there is but one chimney. Those silly moles had not the sense to see that they did not need a door apiece. That shows they have no mother. We will leave the cake on the shore of the mermaid's lagoon. These boys will swim these boys are always swimming and playing about there with the mermaids. They will find the cake and they will gobble it up, because having no mother, they don't know how it, how dangerous it is to eat rich damp cake he burst into laughter not hollow laughter now but honest laughter ah oh, they will die it is the wickedest prettiest policy i have ever heard of he cried and in their ex ex exhilaration they danced and sang a vast belay when i appear by fear they're overtook thought that's left upon your bones when you have shaken claws with hook <clears throat> they began the verse, but they never finished it. For another sound broke in and stilled them. <clears throat> At first, there was such a tiny sound that a leaf might have fallen on it and smothered it. But as it came nearer, it was more distinct. Tick, 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 tick. Hook stood shuddering one foot in the air. The crocodile, he gasped, and bounded away, followed by his bosun. It was indeed a crocodile. It had passed the redskins, who were now on the trail of the other pirates. It oozed after Hook. Once more, the boys emerged into the open. 
but the dangers of the night were not over, for presently nymphs rushed breathlessly into their midst, pursued by a pack of wolves. Tongues of the pursuers were hanging out, and the bang was har the bang of them was horrible. Save me cried nymphs, falling on the ground. But what can we do? It was a high compliment to Peter that in dire moments their thoughts turned to him. What would Peter do? They cried simultaneously. <laughs> All they stood in the same breath, they cried. Peter would look at them through his legs. And then let us do what Peter would do. It is almost, it is quite the most successful way of defying wolves. And as what and as one, the boys bent and looked through their legs. The next moment is a long one, but the victory came quickly, for the boys advanced upon the terrible attitude. A boy advanced upon them in the terrible attitude, and the wolves dropped their tails and fled. Names arose from the ground, and the others thought that his, uh, his staring eyes still saw wolves. But it was not wolves. He saw. I have seen a wonderful thing, a great white bird, and it is flying this way. What kind of bird do you think? I don't know, Nib said, awestruck, but it looks so weary as it flies, it moans, poor Wendy, poor Wendy. I remember, he said slightly instantly, there are, bo there are birds called Wendy's. Come see, said Carly, pointing to Wendy in the heavens. Wendy was now almost overhead, and they could hear a plaintive cry. But more distinctly came the shrill voice of Tinkerbell. The jealous fairy had now cast off all disguise of friendship and was dar darting at her victim from every direction, pinching savage savagely each time she touched. Oh, Tink! Tink's reply rang out. Peter wants you to shoot the Wendy. It was not in their nature to question when Peter ordered. Let's do what Peter wishes. Quick, bows and arrows. All but Tootles popped down their tree. He had bow and arrow with him, and Tink noted it, and rubbed her little hands. Quick, Tootles, quick! Peter will be ever so pleased. Out of the way, Tink, he shouted as he fired at Wendy. Um, as he fired, and then Wendy fluttered to the ground with an arrow in her breast. And that was our chapter of Peter Pan. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like, follow, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Keep reading. Bye for now, readers.